Our final session, our plenary session here, we're pleased to welcome back you know, Dr. Lane G. Tipton from Westminster Theological Seminary. Uh, Lane is doing a lot of excellent work in redemptive historical theology these days. So many of you know that he's on the on the committee, that uh, the study committee that's studying uh, the, the question of uh, the republication of the uh, covenant of works in the Mosaic period, and it, if that's a thing, and whether or not, and how. And, uh, and so he's been looking at that. He addressed us last year, looking at many of those features and talked about Moses and the sons of God last year. This year, he's continuing on, on this theme, but in continuing from the first plenary address now, speaking about new mythology and Moses. So another rich topic, one we're eagerly anticipating, looking forward to hearing. And uh, please welcome once again, Dr. Lane G. Tipton. If you have a Bible, turn to 2 Corinthians 3. Um, we're going to look at verses 6 through 18. And what I'm going to do is walk through this text and try to show the pattern that I hinted at in the first lecture and then briefly extend this pattern and probe another text in light of it. Uh, but we'll look at uh, 2 Corinthians 3, uh, verses 6 through 18. I, I won't address every single verse as thoroughly as others. Here now the reading of God's word. I'll start in verse four. Such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God, who has made us competent to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Now, if the ministry of death carved in letters on stone came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of its glory, which was being brought to an end, will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? For if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness must far exceed it in glory. Indeed, in this case, what once had glory has come to have no glory at all because of the glory that surpasses it. For if what was being brought to an end came with glory, much more will what is permanent have glory. Since we have such a hope, we are very bold, not like Moses who put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. But their minds were hardened for the to this day when they read the Old Covenant, that same veil remains unlifted because only through Christ is it taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, and we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another, for this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Let us now think about what we saw in 1 Corinthians 15, just for a brief refresher. Paul argued from the fullness of the resurrection life that dawns in Christ to the impotency of what was found in Adam. Christ receives a spiritual body as raised, but he is also constituted life-giving spirit in that resurrection. He becomes both the possessor and the conveyor of resurrection life in the spirit in such a way that Adam's life is by comparison death-like, susceptible to a return to the dust, unlike Christ. In 2 Corinthians 3, 6 through 18, Paul applies the same sort of logic 
but it is not applied to Adam, but Moses. Not to the Adamic covenant of works, but the Mosaic covenant of grace. And the comparison and contrast here turns on different epochs within redemptive history, Mosaic and new, respectively, old and new, respectively. The contrast with Adam was the contrast between pre-redemptive life and what is given to Christ in resurrection. And the contrast here is between redemptive life under the old covenant and redemptive life under the new. The framing statement is in 2 Corinthians 3.6. And it is a programmatic summary we'll try to make sense of. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. The letter representing the old Mosaic covenant and the spirit representing the new covenant. Now this text has been uh, interpreted and exegeted in a number of ways. But I want to outline a classical Lutheran scheme of interpreting this text and then use the Lutheran approach as something of a foil to frame the comments that I'm going to make about the meaning of this section of Scripture from 2 Corinthians 3, 6 through 18. And I want us to note the importance that Paul's pneumatology plays in the contrast that he's drawing. The Lutheran view sees the contrasts as antithetical principles of demand and promise, respectively. The letter focuses on law as demand, pure and simple. As the law demands, it condemns. As the law demands, or the letter demands, it exposes sin. As the letter demands, it kills, pure and simple. The Spirit, on the other hand, focuses on the gospel as promise. The gospel makes a promise that satisfies the demand of the letter. The gospel promises justification where the letter's demand exposes condemnation. So that the focus on the law is, or letter is doing, the focus on the gospel or the spirit is believing. It's a contrast of that sort. Luther himself, comments on this text and says this, many are persuaded that Paul deals in 2 Corinthians 3 with the ceremonial righteousness which is now repealed. Yet he is speaking of the whole law and comparing law with grace. That's key, law with grace, not law with law. In brief, then, let us point out, quote continues, that there are two ministries of preaching, one of the letter, the other of the Spirit. The letter is the law, the Spirit is grace. The first belongs to the old covenant, the second to the new. The glory of the law is the knowledge of sin. The glory of the Spirit is that revelation or knowledge of grace, which is faith. Therefore, the law did not justify. Indeed, since human frailty found it unbearable, grace is veiled by it on Mount Tabor even to the present time from his works, 32-177. Now the point, at least in this formulation for Luther himself, 
is that the letter is devoid of redemptive reality. The glory of the letter is the revelation of sin. The glory of the Spirit is the revelation of righteousness or grace. The letter in its entirety only kills and condemns. And so the contrast should be understood in this way. The contrast between the letter and the Spirit is an absolute qualitative principial contrast. An absolute qualitative principial contrast. It is a contrast between antithetical principles of condemnation and justification, of doing or believing. It is not a contrast in, de in degree, but in kind. It is an absolute contrast stated in absolute terms. Now, what can we say to a formulation like this, particularly if we're looking for a pattern between 1 Corinthians 15 and 2 Corinthians 3? Well, when we look more carefully at the sustained argument in 2 Corinthians 3, 6 through 18, please note this because I believe it's critical. What comes into view as the point of comparison is the letter coupled with Moses' fading glory on the one side and the Spirit and the Lord's abiding glory on the other side. Paul correlates explicitly the letter and Moses' fading glory in verse 7. The letter came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of its glory. Which verse 13 says was being brought to an end. But on the other hand, the Lord embodies a surpassing glory. Verse 10 which Paul in verse 18 calls the glory of the Lord, the glory of the Lord who is the Spirit. So what we have to start to grasp as a kind of interpretive key for 2 Corinthians 3 is that what Moses says about the nature of the letter must be accessed through Moses' person Moses' work, and Moses' fading glory. That's a concrete tethering point to understand this text. Now, if that's the case, and there is a distinction between the letter that kills and the spirit who gives life, what are we to make of the reference to Moses the repeated reference to Moses and his glory. Well, it turns us to reflect together for a brief time on Exodus 32 through 34 and to the transformation of Moses' countenance in that narrative. What we need to appreciate is this for an initial observation. The theological significance of the person and face of Moses is a symbol of life under the letter. A symbol of life under the letter. We have to recognize in summary capsule form here that responsible interpretation of this text must appreciate the reference to the glory of Moses' face where the Lord through Moses' mediation graciously forgives sin and grants a temporary stay of life to his wilderness people and continues to abide in a communion bond with them in his grace and in his mercy. Exodus 32, 30 through 33, 5. Uh, uh, I just want to 
highlight, the, Moses speaks to the people in this way with regard to the sin of the golden calf. You have sinned a great sin. And now I will go up to the Lord and perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. So Moses returned to the Lord and he said, these people have sinned a great sin. They have made for themselves gods of gold. But now listen, if you will forgive their sin, but if not, please blot me out of your book that you have written. What is Moses doing? Listen, he's, and we'll make this point clear here in a second, he's offering himself on behalf of the people. And he's saying, if you blot them out, blot me out as well. But the Lord said to Moses in 32, 33, whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book, but go now, lead the people to the place about which I've spoken. Behold, my angel shall go before you Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. And then the Lord sent a plague on the people because they made the calf the one that Aaron made. But it's in that context that the Lord tells Moses to depart and to go up flowing with, uh, go up to the land flowing with milk and honey and says, I will not go with you lest I consume you on the way. So what does it look like? Please hear this. It looks like there is only wrath and curse and death and condemnation for Israel as a wilderness generation, doesn't it? So you read to 33, 12 and following. Moses then said to the Lord, see, you say to me, bring up this people and verse 13, if I have found favor in your sight, show me your ways that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider too that this nation is your people. What does he do? He intercedes on behalf of Israel and invokes the promises of God in the patriarchs and calls God to remember his promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he says, how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and the people? Is it not in you going with us so that we are distinct, I and your people from every other people on the face of the earth? In other words, Moses is saying, if your presence is not with us in a covenantal and redemptive communion bond, all is in vain. We have nothing without you. What did the Lord say? The Lord said to Moses, the very thing you have spoken, I will do for you have found favor in my sight and I know you by name. And Moses bows before the Lord and the Lord continues with this people in the wilderness through Moses mediation and by remembering the promises that he made to the patriarchs through Moses mediation the Lord forgives the sin of a wilderness generation grants them a temporary stay of life and abides with them in route to Canaan the letter of which Moses is an exemplar, is not exclusively a ministry of death. It is, in fact, a ministry of life. Life that is conveyed through Moses' mediation on behalf of a sinful people. Wrath does not break out against sin in such a way that it eradicates a people from the presence of God. The Lord will continue to abide with his people through Moses' intercession, an intercession that is certainly typical of Christ's. And when Moses comes down from the mountain in 34, 29 through 35, 
He comes down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in hand. And he did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. And the Israelites saw him and were, were afraid and began to run. And what did Moses do? He said, come near. And they came near and Moses spoke to them of what had happened on the mountain. And Moses put a veil over his face, which was shining. Here's what I want you to appreciate. The Shekinah glory of Moses' face is a visual symbol of the forgiveness and life that was secured through Moses' mediation. The glory of Moses' countenance is a typical sign of the forgiveness of sin and continuation of life and communion with God that was granted through Moses' mediation. In fact, Gerhardus Voss points out that in Exodus 32, please hear this, there is a heightened, escalated typological significance to Moses' person and Moses' work in the Old Testament. And it turns on the fact that Moses, as a type of the Messiah, intercedes on behalf of the people of God without a sacrifice. He, unlike Aaron, offers himself on behalf of the people of God. He pleads with God and the Lord recognizes Moses and knows Moses. Voss puts it this way on page 104 of his biblical theology. Moses acquires, quote, acquires typical proportions of an unusual degree. End of quote. Moses goes before the people, uh, before the Lord, to make atonement for the people. He performs a unique and intensive typological function in the Old Testament, a heightened function, and he says this, Voss, Moses intercedes for Israel after the commission of the sin of the golden calf, and that by offering his own person vicariously for bearing the punishment of the guilty. Page 104 still. Moses offers his own person and typically and vicariously offers to bear the punishment of the guilty. Blot me out on their behalf. Now, one reason why Voss says this is heightened typology is that whether you think retrospectively back to Abraham in Genesis 22, or whether you're thinking prospectively of days of atonement where Aaron is offering sacrifices, scapegoat, blood offering, burnt offering, the point is that Abraham on the one side and Aaron on the other side offer not themselves, but a sacrificial animal. Moses offers his own person, and he does this vicariously, as Voss notes. What does this tell us? Please listen. I think this is the trajectory. This is an adumbration of a different priesthood, a Melchizedekian priesthood, in which the high priest offers himself on behalf of the people in order to make atonement for sin and secure the communion bond that God has with his people. Christ offered himself, as the author of Hebrews reminds us, once for all, not by offering the blood of goats and bulls, but by offering his own blood. My point is this. Voss helps us grasp that the narrative in Exodus 32 through 34 and the transformation of Moses' countenance 
portrays Moses in a heightened typical function that uniquely anticipates the work of the Messiah. Moses' mediation is not merely a type of Christ, but a heightened and intensified type of Christ, as we say. A type of Christ that is unique. And it is that reality that is typically and prophetically etched, as it were, on his countenance. But here's the problem. Moses' glory as he descends from Mount Sinai, Moses' glory is fading. Growing directly out of this episode is Moses' fading glory. And the problem from the standpoint of the Old Testament itself is this, how will the communion bond of God, the presence of God, continue with God's people if it is secured through Moses and Moses' glory is fading. How will that continue? This is the problem viewed from within the Old Testament itself. And, and think more specifically. Through Moses' intercession, what did God do? God forgave a very specific set of sins, worship of the golden calf, and will abide for a limited time with the wilderness generation. And so you have an ad hoc forgiveness of sin and a temporary stay of life, and it points to something that cannot be eschatological in character. Moses was concerned to secure pardon and life for the generation that was with him in the wilderness and his intercession brought that particular group into view and did not extend beyond them. Accordingly, the provisional and fading glory of Moses, the ad hoc character of the redemptive provision, turns up this point that the typical indicative under Moses is limited and in itself incomplete. What transpires under Moses is sub-eschatological. As goes Moses' glory, so goes God's presence with his wilderness people under the letter. And this means, among other things, that Moses' glory is not only typical, it is prophetic. It's not only typical, it is prophetic. It demands a greater glory that secures for God's people eternal communion with God. Now, it's out of that context that Paul draws the contrast between the glory under the letter and the glory of the Spirit. And what starts to appear is this in verse 10. What once had glory, namely Moses as a mediator between God and Israel, now has come to have no glory because of the glory that surpasses it, namely the glory of the Lord, who is the Spirit. The glory associated with Moses and his mediation has come to have no glory because the glory of the Spirit of Christ eschatologically supersedes that former glory. And it's in that reasoning, in that pattern of reasoning, that I want you to make sense of verses 7 through 11. Note this. If the ministry of death carved in letters on stone came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of its glory, which was being brought to an end, will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? Verse 9, for if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness must far exceed it in glory. Verse 10, indeed, in this case, what once had glory has come to have no glory at all because of the glory that surpasses it. For if what was being brought to an end came with glory, much more will what is permanent have glory. You see, the contrast, note this, 
is not an absolute contrast between a principle that only condemns the letter and a principle that only justifies the spirit. Instead, the contrast is qualified. It's qualified by lesser and greater glory. Both the letter and the spirit come with glory, but a lesser glory is associated with Moses, the greater glory associated with the Lord, verse 18. To try to put it in a capsule form, Moses' fading glory is a sign of both the efficacy and the provisionality of his mediation. So the contrast between seven and eight, between the ministry of death and the ministry of the spirit turns on a difference in glory. The ministry of condemnation and the ministry of righteousness turns on a distinction between lesser and greater glory. What once had glory has lost its glory because of the surpassing glory. Here's an illustration. The point is that the old which had glory that supplied for forgiveness of sin and an extension of life for the wilderness generation now has no glory because of something that surpasses that glory. So what is Paul doing? He's doing this. Paul is appealing to Moses' luminous countenance as a microcosm for the letter as a whole. Moses' glory becomes a kind of synecdoche, a part that is applied to the whole, the ministry of the letter. And so we can say this, to be united with the ascended Christ means that believers are being transformed from glory to glory and a veil remains anytime someone assumes that the redemptive life conveyed by God through Moses is ultimate. A veil remains anytime someone mistakes the provisional for the permanent, the letter for the spirit, but the veil is removed when someone turns to the Lord. And so think of it this way. Paul draws a relative contrast between the letter represented by Moses' fading glory and the spirit functionally identical to the Lord and argues in verse 11 that what was being brought to an end came with glory, how much more of what is permanent. It seems then that, that what Paul is pushing us to appreciate is that Christ brings a righteousness and a life not to a cross-section of people, the wilderness generation. He brings righteousness to the whole covenantal household of God, the transtestamental church. He brings not merely a temporary stay of life, but he brings resurrection life in the spirit. He rises never to die again. He rises with the power of an indestructible life. He rises as the first fruits of the one great resurrection harvest at the end of this age. And those who are baptized into Christ are baptized into a righteousness and life that supersedes Moses as the anti-type supersedes the type. Now, here's what I want you to look at, think about. I want you to notice the book ending function of the spirit in verse 6 and 17 of 2 Corinthians 3. The Spirit gives life. Verse 17, the Lord who is the Spirit. What brackets the comparisons and contrasts between the letter and the Spirit is the functional identification of Christ and the Spirit. The Spirit gives life, and the Lord is the Spirit. What does that sound like? 1 Corinthians 15, 45, Christ has become life-giving Spirit. 
In other words, framing this discussion in 2 Corinthians 3 is the same point of departure as 1 Corinthians 15, 45. Paul is reflecting on what has transpired in Christ's resurrection, ascension, and spirit endowment so that he is now the Lord who is the spirit. Hypostatically distinct, functionally identical. And what this moves us to think about is this. The righteousness and forgiveness and temporary stay of life through Moses and the provisional character of Adam's life before the fall are death-like when compared and contrasted to the Lord who is the Spirit, 2 Corinthians 3.17, and the life-giving Spirit, 1 Corinthians 15.45. Adam and Moses were concrete embodiments of orders within covenant history. Whether it is the prelapsarian life of Adam or the redemptive life given by God through Moses' mediation prior to Pentecost, each falls short of the fullness that is realized in Christ as raised, Christ as spirit endowed. By contrast then, Adamic life in the Garden of Eden or redemptive life under Moses becomes death-like in comparison to the life that dawns in Christ. And think about these together. 1 Corinthians 15, 45c, and 2 Corinthians 18, 17, and 18, both of them enshrine as of central significance life-giving spirit, the Lord who is the spirit. In other words, there's a pneumatic center, Christ as life-giving spirit. And think of the correlations between these. Adam's natural body, 44b, Moses' fading glory, 2 Corinthians 3, 7, 11, and 13. The natural body lacks glory, the spiritual body is raised in glory. Moses and the letter came with glory, but the spirit surpasses that glory. Adam's life was provisional, resurrection in the spirit imperishable, 1 Corinthians 15. Moses' glory was being brought to an end, Christ's glory abides. So that Adam and Moses become microcosms of the orders that they represent. Adam represents the sub-eschatological character of life before the fall. Moses represents the sub-eschatological character of redemptive life after the fall and prior to Pentecost. Both modes of life are death-like compared to the plenitude of life that dawns in Christ, who is the Spirit. Remember this, life for Paul, life more broadly in Scripture, means robust and perfected communion with God through Christ by the Spirit, Ephesians 2.18 and 22. So that the righteousness and life that God gave to Adam prior to the fall and through Moses after the fall is as good long-term as death and condemnation. The images Paul once etched in our minds are Adam susceptible to returning to the dust and Moses fading glory. Neither Adam nor Moses bring the fullness of what is brought in Christ. Now, here's what I want you to think about with me as I, I move, move toward an end. I want to suggest something that might help us with other texts in Paul. And I want you to think of Galatians 3 and 4 with me for a moment. 
it appears that the broadest argument in Galatians 3 and 4, if you're just thinking broadly about it, is this. You have the promise that God gives to Abraham, you have the law, and you have the sending of the Son and the gifting of the Spirit. You have promise, law, and Spirit that is given to the Son. And the law of Moses, the covenantal administration of the letter, the broadest point is that it does not fulfill the Abrahamic promise. It does not bring climactic fulfillment to the Abrahamic promise. And it does not do so because the sending of the Son and the gifting of the Spirit together comprise the eschatological fulfillment of the Abrahamic promise. Look at Galatians 3.14, for instance. Paul says that the blessing of Abraham comes to Gentiles through union with Christ. And in him we receive the Spirit by faith. Paul says, in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. What does the law do? The law does not annul the promise but it is union with Christ and the reception of the Spirit by faith that brings to the church the eschatological realization of the Abrahamic promise. The premise then is that until Christ comes in his perfect obedience and consequent spirit endowment, the law does not have the resources in terms of which the Abrahamic promise might be fulfilled. This might be why Paul will say from a certain vantage point, the law is operating under the stoicheia, the elemental principles of the world. That's exactly what Paul says about Israel under the law, enslaved to the stoicheia, the elementary spirits of this world. But here's the issue from the standpoint of the history of salvation. What event affects the transition from stoicheia being under these elemental principles and being enslaved to being free as the sons of God? What event affects that transition out of this present evil age, Galatians 1.4? It's in verse 4 and 6. Paul presents, hear this, the coordinated events of sending the Son, verse 4, and giving the Spirit, verse 6, as the eschatological realities that fulfill the Abrahamic promises and affect the transition out of the elemental principles of the world and into the age to come. Now, the sending of the Son in Galatians 4.4, 4, in the fullness of time, the Son was sent forth to what? To be born of a woman, to be born under the law, in order to redeem those who are under it. That denotes the Son's estate of humiliation, where he is born under the law, climaxing in the death of the cross. The giving of the Spirit is a reference to what? Christ's resurrection and ascension. In fact, look at verse 4-6. Tell me if this sounds familiar. The church, in union with Christ by the Spirit, has received the Spirit of the Son. That is, I, that is conceptually identical to life-giving Spirit in 1 Corinthians 15-45 and to the Lord who is the Spirit in 2 Corinthians 3, 7, the Spirit of the Son shades more toward the Romans 8, 9 through 11 designation that what we receive in union with Christ post-Pentecost is the Spirit of the Son. And it is the Spirit of the Son that is who is poured out on the day of Pentecost 
and frames the basic redemptive reality in which the church participates. Here's the point. From the standpoint of the book of Galatians in 3 and 4, it is the sending of the Son and the Spirit endowment of the Son that brings the great transition out from the elemental principles of the world under the law and into freedom and the Jerusalem that is above. The correlations between Galatians 4, 6 on the one hand and 1 Corinthians 15, 45 and 2 Corinthians 3 on the other hand help us see this, that perhaps the point of departure for the contrast drawn in chapter 4 center on the Pauline pneumatology. It is precisely within the matrix of the Pauline pneumatology, the spirit of the Son, gifted to the church to bring freedom and righteousness in life. It is precisely within that context that Paul draws the contrast between the Jerusalem that is below, verse 25, and the Jerusalem that is above, verse 26. The latter being the fulfillment of the Abrahamic promise, which is realized in the presence of the eschatological spirit of the Son. The Jerusalem above brings into view the exaltation of the Lord who is the Spirit. And he goes so far as to apply an analogous rhetorical tool from 2 Corinthians 3, and he applies it to Sinai and Zion, where he speaks of two covenants. Why does he do it? What is his point? It is to convince those who want to be under the law in 21 that it is not the law that generates Pentecost. It is Christ by the Spirit, Christ receiving and pouring out the Spirit, it is that reality that inaugurates the age to come and in inaugurating the age to come brings to fulfillment the Abrahamic promise. You see, if these observations are on the mark, it seems that Paul does with Sinai the Jerusalem that is below what he does with prelapsarian life in the covenant of works, 1 Corinthians 15, and the typologically mediated redemptive life associated with Moses and the letter. But what he's not doing is making an unqualified law gospel contrast. It's just not there. It's not a bare or unqualified demand that brings condemnation and a bare unqualified promise that brings justification that's in view. It is from the lesser glory of Moses to the greater glory of Christ that Paul draws these contrasts. And to the extent that they are sound and warranted in light of 1 Corinthians 15 and 2 Corinthians 3, it seems that it could shed some light, not answer all questions, but shed some light on the way pneumatology and Christ's spirit endowment drives the contrasts that Paul is making in Galatians 4, which have vexed a number of interpreters. Now, what I've tried to do in these two lectures is turn up a pattern. And the pattern takes its point of departure from Christ as raised, Christ ascended, Christ as possessor and conveyor of resurrection life in the spirit. And from that vantage point, recognize that Paul seems characteristically to look at earlier instances of life and construe them as death-like. 1 Corinthians 15 as condemnation and death, 2 Corinthians 3, as bondage, Galatians 4, as fleshly, 4, 29, in contrast to what is fleshly and, and heavenly, the 
the heavenly Jerusalem of the spirit, the Jerusalem below, fleshly in the sense we've defined. And, and when we see that, it opens up this opportunity to replace in our understanding in these contrasts a flat law gospel contrast with a richly textured and nuanced redemptive historical contrast that brings into view the central interpretive significance of Christ who is the Spirit. In a sense, once Christ comes and once he is endowed by the Spirit, everything else by comparison seems death-like though it had life and glory. Now from that standpoint then, I want us to, to, to just probe the Bible, particularly what Paul is doing, in light of this, this kind of pattern of reasoning. And when we do, I think it will expand some horizons for us to see the way Paul's eschatology of the Spirit doesn't shed light on just one or two portions of his theology, but kind of envelops the whole and gives it its center of gravity and its point of departure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lane, for bringing us that message. Is Arian here still? Maybe back. Would you be willing to, to lead us again in another song since we, we do have uh, breakout sessions uh, coming up here at uh, 3.30. Um, but seeing that we will not have a, another session altogether, I think we can sing a hymn that in many ways uh, can encapsulate many of the threads of the lectures and the addresses that we've already done. 3.45, uh, Glorious Things of Thee Are Spoken, I think is a good hymn on this particular topic. After we sing, I'll have a couple more announcements and we can uh, dismiss to our breakout sessions. Hymn 345, Glorious Things of Thee Are Spoken. Hymn 345. Let's stand as we raise our voices.
breakout sessions here uh, upstairs uh, the theological implications of pneumatology question and answer session with Lane and also at 3:30 Jonathan Edwards pastor apologist uh, led by Jeff Waddington if you're able to join us tomorrow we'd love to have you here for worship uh, Dr. Gaffin will be preaching the service uh, preaching the sermon in the morning service on Philippians 1:6 and Dr. Tipton will be leading the Sunday school lesson and for those of you who are not able to join us. We uh, are love to uh, continue talking with you the rest of this day, but I want to thank you all for joining us and uh, we hope that you have safe travels. Uh, you're dismissed. I tried to pull up the uh, Michigan score in that ad. Started the video ad. Started the video. <laughs> hey, are you out of here, brother? Oh, no, you're